Right. So thank you everyone for coming to this episode of the Intramuros Learning Session. So we are already at our 73rd episode. So we are proud to present uh, this special webinar that we're going to have today in support of the Philippine Commission on Women and in celebration of National Women's Month for this year, 2022. Now for uh, this uh, webinar, we're going to have a discussion on women, of course. But before we start, just some house rules. So, of course, the house rules. So uh, for our Zoom attendees, you may raise your questions via the chat button or via the Q&A button. And for our FB viewers, you can also raise your questions in the comment section below. Take note that only those who have successfully registered and viewed on Zoom will be eligible to get a certificate. Uh, a feedback form will be emailed to you after the session and a certificate will be sent within a week. Uh, for those who are in Facebook who wish to receive a certificate, you can still register via Zoom. So feel free to transfer to Zoom if you wish. Now note this, that this webinar is recorded and the recording shall be made perpetually available in our social media channels. And of course, uh, just to uh, manage expectations, if you are joining via Zoom, of course, your name will be visible to other people as well. So uh, just to uh, know, Take note na lang. The most that you can do is you can rename na lang your uh, name if you want to remain anonymous. Anyway, so to introduce our speaker for this afternoon, we have none other than the distinguished and most celebrated Dr. Maria Luisa Camagay, who is a Professor Emeritus at the Department of History at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Her research interests are in the history of women, urban history and local history. Now she has the following uh, degrees. She has a doctorate in history from the School of Advanced Studies in Social Sciences from Paris. She also has a master's in geography from the University of Paris, Pantheon Sorbonne. She has a master's in teaching from the University of the Philippines, as well as a bachelor of science in education from the University of the Philippines. Uh, a multi-awarded author, she is a recipient of the following uh, two National Book Awards, one from 1995 and another from 2006, the Chevalier de Palmes Academics from the Government of France in 2006, Patubay ng Sining at Kalinangan in 2006 as well. She, she is also a Natatanging Guru Gawad Chancellor Awardee. And of course, in 2016, she was... Uh, uh, declared a professor emeritus at the University of the Philippines. Right, so without further ado, uh, we shall now start with the presentation of Dr. Kamagay. Okay. Thank you, Rancho. Uh, kindly get, be ready with my PowerPoint. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you uh, via Zoom. Everything now is virtual. Uh, but uh, I'm happy that uh, through this uh, platform, we are able to reach as many uh, people as possible. Okay, uh, Rancho, can we start my PowerPoint, please? Uh, yes, Paul. Okay, so uh, in celebration of Women's Month uh, here in the Philippines, um, I uh, accepted the invitation of the Intramuros administration to give, uh, to celebrate, no, uh, also, and memorialize uh, the working women of Manila in the 19th century. So uh, uh, I'll be confining it to working women of Manila in the 19th century. Next slide, please. Okay, so 
the objective of this presentation is to find out the principal occupations of women in the suburbs of Manila in the 19th century as found in the vicindarios or the list of inhabitants, particularly during the years 1886 to 1887. So um, uh, uh, we will take a look at what were the dominant occupations of women in the Arabales of Manila, because Manila will be referring to, uh, will be referred to as the as Intramuros and the areas of Tundo, Pinondo, Santa Cruz, uh, etc., were called suburbios or Arabales of uh, Manila or Intramuros. Next slide, please. Okay, when you take a look at the vicindario, for example, of Tondo. Uh, you have uh, the names no? uh, appearing, then you have three columns, no? uh, three columns, yes. So after the names, you have the first column, uh, it's labeled idat, so the age of the woman uh, there. The second column is labeled estado or status. So if you see letter A, it is referring to uh, casada, married woman. Kung letter B, if you see letter B there, it refers to soltera or single woman. Uh, and letter C will be a uh, viuda. Uh, okay. Then the third column will be labeled official or occupation. So, uh, Number one would be costurera, number two, cigarera, number three, lavandera, number four, tindera. You know, this was a work done by, uh, by my two research assistants when I was writing the book, Working Women of Manila. And I'd like to give credit to them uh, because they, they had to organize the mass of data in this manner. So um, I'd like, publicly to acknowledge my two um, research assistant, uh, Mr. Dennis Santiago and uh, Ms. Uh, Maria, Fe, uh, Cleo, Maria Cleope, um, what's her name now, Marpa. Okay, so I really uh, owe the data, what I am going to present to you through these two research assistants. Next slide, please. Okay. Now, when we speak of the Arabal, Arabales of Manila, which uh, of course is um, at the, in the 19th century was uh, referred to as Intramuros, you will have the Arabales divided uh, north of the Pasig and south of the Pasig. Uh, so north of the Pasig, you will have the Arabales of Tundo, Binondo, Santa Cruz, Quiapo, San Paloc, San Miguel, and south of the Pasi would be Ermita, Malate, and Paco de Lao. Now, uh, of course, there are other Arabales yet, no? but in the 19th century, the documents would be yielding just, for example, in the south of the Pasi River, uh, Ermita, Malate, and Paco, no? because you have Santa Ana also in the south. But uh, we are uh, confining ourselves to what the data uh, provides. Okay, next slide, please. So if you see a map of Manila and its Arabales, so the map is Plano de Manila's Jesus Arabales, you will see that north, the, the uh, Manila is uh, traversed by the Pasig River. So you will have, when I refer to north of the Pasig, you will see there Tundo, Binondo, Santa Cruz, up to Sampalo. And here, south of the, pa of the Pasig River, you have, of course, Intramuros there. Then you will have uh, Ermita, Malate, and Paco. Okay, next slide, please. Now, when, they, uh, when we took a look at the um, population of women with occupations in 1887, this would be the figure, so Tundo, would have 3,042 women, uh, Binondo, uh, Binondo 3,301, Santa Cruz, 78, 
Quiapo, 985. San Miguel, 235. San Palok, 1,562. Ermita, 1,198. Malate, 864. And Paco de la, 1,346. No? So uh, these were uh, the um, uh, population of women with occupations per Arabales in 1887. Next slide, please. Now, what would be the leading occupations? Uh, okay, for Tundo, you will have the leading occupations would be cigarera, tindera, costurera, operaria, uh, lavandera. Binondo would have costurera, cigarera, lavandera, tindera, jornalera. No? Uh, next slide, please. Santa Cruz would have costurera, cigarera, lavandera, tindera. Quiapo, costurera, cigarera, lavandera, tindera. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, San Palo, cigarera, lavandera, costurera, tindera, jornalera. Uh, San Miguel, costurera, cigarera, lavandera. So you see some very similar uh, or shared occupations no? among the Arabales. Next slide, please. Now, south of the Pasig River, Ermita would have Custurera, Cigarera, Burdadora, Lavandera, Tindera. No? Malate, Burdadora, Custurera, Cigarera, Lavandera, Tindera. Uh, I hope. Uh, I um, uh, you, you have some sense of the meaning of Cusurera. Cusurera is the seamstress. Cigarera is a woman who works in a tobacco factory. Bordadora is an embroiderer, no? a woman embroiderer. Lavandera is a laundry woman. Of course, Tindera is a, uh, uh, um, we, we know it as a salesperson or something like that. Huh? Now, I want you to take note, Ermita and Malati were really known for their Buddha Doras. No? So, uh, and uh, I will explain uh, later on why they were known for this occupation. Next slide, please. And of course, you have Paco, Custurera, Cigarera, Lavandera, and Tindera. Okay, so uh, if we take a look at the dominant, which is the next slide. Okay, these are the leading occupations of women of Manila in the 19th century. Cigarera, present in all Arabales, but heavily coming from Tundo and Binondo. Custurera, present in all Arabales, but dominant in Binondo, Tundo, Paco, Quiapo, and Ermita. Lavandera present in all Arabales, but dominant in San Palo, Quiapo, Tundo, Ermita, and Quiap, and uh, I repeated Quiapo. Tindera present in all Arabales, but heavy in Tundo, Binondo, and San Palo. Next slide, please. Now, there would be occupations of women uniquely found in Arabales. Uh, one would be Quiapo, where you would have women engaged in the making of articles from silver. Sila yung mga tinatawag na plateras. Kaya may, there would be a road in Quiapo, platerias. No? So this would be the area where you have the silversmith uh, working. The bordadoras, as I've mentioned, the embroiderers, were found mostly in the arabales of Ermita and Malate. Next slide, please. Okay, we'll take a look at the leading. One is the cigarera. The cigarera is a woman who is employed to roll cigars. Huh? And the cigarera would emerge when the colonial government established the tobacco monopoly in 1781 during the time of Governor General Jose de Basco y Vargas and was abolished in 1882 during the time of Governor General Primo de Rivera. So it lasted for a century. And women were engaged to roll cigars because they were reputed 
to be honest, not prone to smuggling out cigars from the factory, and were adept at rolling of uh, of rolling cigars. No, uh, the men they were made to uh, uh, they were mobilized in the making of cigarillos or what is known now as cigarettes, but they were prone to smuggling out. They hide the cigarettes in their hats, in their uh, pants, etc. But the women were very honest, no? uh, not really uh, interested or not prone to smuggling out cigars from the factory. Next slide, please. Now, the cigarettes here uh, are, this is a print showing where the fabrica de tobacco was. Uh, that's the Benondo Church, no? Iglesia uh, Parochial de Benondo. And the cigar factory was located beside or adjacent to the church. So if you take a look at the print, number one is the Casa de la Dirección. In other words, it's the office no, of uh, the tobacco monopoly. And number two would be the Fabrica de Tabacos. So uh, uh, if we take a look, there would be uh, factories of tobacco uh, at here in Manila, in Binondo. There was also one in uh, Aruceros. And the others were, be, were uh, located in Malabon and the other one located in Cavite. So there would be uh, those uh, factories. So if you want to take a look at the cigarreras of Manila, uh, and you go to the Philippine National Archives, you will have to look at the uh, bundles or the ligajos called uh, tabacos. But you have to take a look at Tabacos Manila because you will see Tabacos, Nueva Ecija, Tabaco, Cagayan, etc. But if you are just uh, wanting to look on the cigarreras, then uh, you will take a look at Tabaco Manila no, for information about the cigarreras. So you see them now um, in this print, they're all going towards the direction of the factory. Uh, and it's very, I, I, this print is very, very nice for me. Uh, and the foreign visitors of the 19th century at first were surprised. Why are there so many women no, going towards one direction? And they discovered that they were cigarreras uh, on their way to the tobacco factory. Uh, the next slide, please. Okay, the one in Binondo uh, would have two fabricas, no? The Fabrica de Menas Finos, consisting of 380 tables, where 4,300 cigarettes were. These cigars from this factory were intended for export to Europe and India. So Finos, ito yung mga talagang very delicate and well-made cigars. The other one was the Fabrica de Menas Corrientes, consisting, uh, cons which consisted of 180 tables with a workforce of 2,330 women. So this uh, fabrica would uh, uh, take charge of turning out cigars which are for normal and regular use. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so why were they organized in tables? So this is just to give you an idea uh, of how they work. No? So the cigarera is seated on the floor facing a low table and they uh, are like an assembly line. No? So there will be somebody who would uh, pound the tobacco leaf uh, to make it more pliable. Then another one will have to put the uh, shredded tobacco leaves inside, then roll it. And uh, there would be uh, also one who would uh, uh, cut uh, the leaf run, oh, and trim it. And then of course, somebody should weigh it and pack you know, the cigars in boxes. Okay, so just to give you an idea, that's why, why tables, because they're organized according to tables. And there would be about 10 to 11 
uh, women in the table. Next slide, please. Okay, so I think this one would, would be early American period because uh, the cigarreras were still present, early American period, but they were seated now in chairs no? and uh, high tables, unlike uh, uh, the 19th century. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, here is a woman trimming cigars uh, with the scissors. No? Uh, and then next slide, please. Okay, this one, I think early American period, you have the tobacco leaves uh, being shredded already. So it's no longer manually prepared. You have machines. Next slide, please. Okay, these are women uh, sorting, no? uh, stripping the tobacco leaves. Okay. Uh, it's, it's not a joke because they say that the smell of tobacco is really very strong uh, as well, no? Uh, and you have a very congested working space. So they, they really um, uh, had to contend with uh, such conditions. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, when the, um, uh, the state monopoly ended, the tobacco manufacturing or cigar manufacturing went into private hands. And so, for example, in this particular picture, this is a uh, tobacco factory which was owned by a Dutch. No? And uh, inside the, the house or the building would be uh, women no? there in um, working again, like the usual, uh, seated on the floor in front of low tables. And uh, I think this Dutch, uh, I, heard, I read from the book uh, which mentioned this, that we were uh, sending cigarreras to Surabaya in the Dutch East Indies before to teach the Indonesian women how to roll cigars because the Dutch had the, uh, you know, the uh, culture system and they were also, um, into uh, wide scale cultivation of tobacco. And uh, they, uh, that's why I call them the first OFW. They were sent, some of these cigarreras were sent to uh, Surabaya in the Dutch East Indies during the 19th century to teach you know, the Indonesian women. That's why it's also interesting at this point in time, how, how, how was the uh, cigarera of the Philippines was compared to the cigarera of uh, Surabaya in, in the present day Indonesia. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so just a, a, another uh, uh, picture of, uh, of the assembly line no? uh, uh, found in, in one table. No? Okay. Next slide, please. Okay, this is how, how they were. They are grouped according to tables with about 10 to 11 women around each table. Two women were tasked to moisten, stretch and remove the stem. Seven rolled the cigars, while one counted, bundled and weighed the cigars. Those assigned the task of rolling cigars were provided a stone as large as a lemon with which to beat the tobacco leaf. Once the leaf was rendered pliable, the cigarera would put a small quantity of chopped tobacco at the center of the leaf, a little gum on one end, and then would roll it to its desired form. So uh, not only would you uh, contend with heat, but also the, um, the sound that you hear when the um, the cigarera has to beat the tobacco leaf with a stone, you know, as large as a lemon. Next slide, please. Uh, she is made to report to work uh, from six in the morning up to 12 noon, and then from two in the afternoon until six. So that's her work uh, schedule. And then she would be subjected to two bodily inspections in a day one when she goes off for lunch 
and the other when she leaves the fabrica at the end of the day. Penalties were imposed on badly rolled cigars, as well as packing of tobacco in excess of the expected way, weight. No? Uh, and for feature of a day's wage was a usual punishment. The cigarera earned about two pesos a month. Next slide, please. Now, so after uh, the end of um, the monopoly, as I mentioned, there would be uh, uh, private uh, entities uh, uh, assuming no, the making of cigars. Because, you know, Philippine cigars were reputed to be better than the Havana cigars of Cuba. And by the 19th century, we, uh, Spain only had three colonies left, Cuba or Cuba, Filipinas, and uh, Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico. So when the uh, monopoly ended, which was a very good revenue uh, earning uh, enterprise for the colony, and they saw this uh, private, uh, it went into private hands like the Insular Cigar and Cigarette Factory. Oh, that's the factory. Next slide, please. Uh, of course, Tabacalera, also the Compania General de Tabacos de Filipinas. And uh, you will see, um, next slide, please, it's factory. So the Fabrica de Tabacos of the Tabacalera. Uh, next slide, please. Now, in 1892, uh, there would be a list of tobacco factories. These are all private owned. Uh, and so you will have to just imagine that uh, this to be new and private tobacco factories still needed the manpower. And so the cigarera was not really uh, out of job uh, with the end of the tobacco monopoly, but you still had openings for them because of this list of tobacco factories. No? So for example, the um, is, uh, Flor de la uh, Isabela, de la Compania General de Tabacos in Looban, uh, La Montañesa in Looban, uh, La Constancia in San Marcelino, uh, uh, La Exportadora in Cervantes Binondo, La Favorita in Anduague, uh, La Flor de Filipinas in Binondo, La Insular in Ichague, Quiapo, Maria Cristina in Goite, uh, Santa Cruz. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, La Honrades in, Honrades in Escolta, La Henciana, this was the one owned by the Dutch, in uh, David Binondo, La Minerva in Hulo Binondo, El Oriente, uh, Gunao, Quiapo, and Para Usted in San Jeronimo, Quiapo. So in other words, this also explains uh, why you would have a lot of cigarreras in Binondo and uh, Tondo, for example, no? because you had factories where we, which were located in the area. And ideally, the, um, the one who works in a tobacco factory should have a residence which is walking distance only from the factory. No? So she does not have to commute. So she has to have uh, some walking distance. And this also explains why there would be a lot of accessories in Binondo and Tondo or in other parts of the Arabales, because this would be an accessory is like a, an apartment. Uh, the cigarette will have to rent a place which would be close you know, and convenient uh, or walking distance from uh, the factory. Okay, next slide, please. Now, the second uh, uh, official or occupation was seamstress, costurera, no? the costurera. Now, the service of the costurera was indispensable since everything was hand sewn from clothes, bed linens, tablecloths, etc. So she was needed, her services were needed. Now she is described as leaving her house to go to the home of her customer with a timbal already in her finger 
and a needle tuck in her kusod, in her bun. So parang naging pin cushion yung kanyang uh, uh, bun. No? Then because of their great number, their services were cheap. Below is a folk song featuring the Custurera. Next slide, please. So this is a folk song about the Custurera and it reads, Angge is my name, dressmaking is my trade, all day long till evening, my poor hands are always sewing. No matter how hard I work, not a penny I can save. Alas, I can earn only just enough for food and rent. No? So that's why there's that mention of rent that uh, usually um, uh, the costurera will just go to the customer and uh, she has to have she has to rent a place for her own. No? Okay, next slide, please. Now, there are remarks about the Kusurera, usually coming from foreigners or foreign visitors of the 19th century. So according to an English businessman, a Kusurera was part of his household. So this one, uh, it shows that the Kusurera now is no longer frequenting his uh, or her uh, customer, but is considered part of the household together with the uh, uh, let's say the uh, cook, uh, the servants, etc. And she was paid $6 a month. Then a comment made by uh, Amer an American, she says, when I arrived here, a seamstress worked nine hours a day for 20 cents gold and her dinner. Now in Manila, a seamstress working for Americans receives 50 cents gold so 30 cents more and sometimes 75 cents and her dinner, though the Spanish, Filipinos and Chinese pay less. So this is coming from Mary, Mary Helen Fee, uh, a woman's impressions of the Philippines. So the, the presence of the foreigners really uh, increased the wage. It had the effect of increasing the wage of the Custurera. Next slide, please. Now, the Custurera will be working uh, with the group. So you would have here a Sinamayera, coming from the word Sinamay, a textile. Uh, and uh, a Sinamayera will be a woman who sells textile. And she's often shown uh, in this manner. Uh, you see that they will always be having under their left arm the textiles no, that she would sell. So uh, you see that one uh, on the left the, would have not only the textiles, but also a, a uh, yardstick or a meter stick and uh, a list. No? Uh, we don't know which, uh, what that list, it could be the, her, her stock of textiles no, uh, are there written out. Now the other uh, Sinamayera is opening a door of her stall. No? And uh, usually the Sinamayeras were located uh, along, their stalls were located along Calle Rosario in Binondo, uh, which is now Quintin Paredes, no? the present Quintin Paredes. Now, but both of them, as you will see, are very fashionista. They're well dressed. No? They have to be to advertise the textiles that uh, they are selling. So uh, what really uh, they they have different fashion sense. You have the because uh, at the time women had the baro, no, the blouse, the saya, your skirt, and your tapis, no, uh, which covers the skirt and uh, of course a, a scarf or a panuelo. Uh, and uh, you see also here on the right, uh, uh, it's more colorful because you have there uh, stripes and checkered. Uh, so her barro is uh, uh, striped, then her uh, skirt is checkered and her tapis is also striped, but uh, you also have the panuelo. 
So uh, they were usually women of really of some means because uh, uh, in fact, there is mentioned that two sisters of the father of Paterno, Pedro Paterno, two aunts of his were Sinamayeras. No? They were Chinese mestizos, mestizas. Okay. Next slide, please. Now, the Burdadoras no? uh, are also part of the uh, Costurera, the Sinamayera, and the Burdadoras because uh, they will be engaged in order to embroider the nipis or the piña. And as I mentioned, Ermita and Malate were two Arabales which were known for their skilled bordadoras. And testimonies of their skill were written by foreign travelers of the Philippines in the 19th century. Uh, among them were John Bowring, the British governor of Hong Kong, Jean Mala, the French doctor, Fyodor Yagor, uh, the German scholar, and Commander John Wilkes, head of the United States Exploring Expedition in 1859. Next slide, please. Okay, so the testimony of John Bowring, uh, he mentions, uh, quote, La Ermita and other villages are remarkable for their burdadoras who produce their exquisite piña handkerchiefs for which large sums are paid. A small handkerchief cost one or two ounces of gold. So this was a comment from Sir John Bowery. Next slide, please. Jean Mala, the French uh, doctor says, when the piña is plain, which is not usual, one has it embroidered by the embroiderers of Ermita and Malate near Manila or Intramuros who excelled in this kind of work. The embroideries that they turn out offer proof of an almost unbelievable patience. patience. They are an admirable beauty, which would be impossible to imitate in Europe. The most notable and pleasing are those called desilados and those calados. These are open work embroideries. Okay, next slide, please. Fyodor Yagor says, in the Philippines, where the fineness of the work is best understood and appreciated, richly embroidered costumes of this description have fetched more than 20,000 reals each. And lastly, we have the American commander Charles Wicks, who headed a United States exploring expedition in 1842, paid a visit to one of the houses of Manila, presumably in Ermita, where skilled women were embroidering piña, a great variety of dresses, scarves, caps, collars, cuffs, and pocket handkerchiefs were demonstrated. Uh -huh. uh, next slide, please. Okay, so look at the uh, the, the, the piña. So they they come plain, but they are embroidered uh -huh, heavily. And towards the later, uh, late 19th century, the sleeves were getting to be bigger. They were probably an adaptation of the Philippine uh, women's wear because in the US, in Europe or in the Western world, there was this thing called the mutton, leg of mutton sleeves, leg of mutton, so they're big, no? And I think uh, when the Filipina tried to adapt that leg of mutton uh, sleeve, the sleeves became wider, you know, giving chance for more embroidery you know, to be shown. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so it's uh, an embroidered piña, very gossamer. Uh, next slide, please. And they are here. So we, we would see that the rich really showed off their wealth by the uh, choice of textile, usually piña or what they call me piece, and also the embroidery in this piña uh, because it's really handmade. It's uh, human labor, no? it's not machine embroidered. Okay. 
Next slide, please. So you will see uh, some pictures of Burdadoras uh, working. Uh, I think uh, this one would be the uh, tablecloth or table linens. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, many uh, women here. Uh, it's a um, uh, school because it also became part of the curriculum. No? Uh, you know, embroidery. Next slide, please. Okay. And usually in um, in uh, what do you call this orphanages, uh, the orphans are. Uh, made to learn embroidery. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay, the third would be the lavanderas. Now, uh, for the lavanderas in the 19th century in Manila, laundry was collected from homes and brought to a nearby estero or a tributary of the Pasig River uh, to be laundered. No? Or it may be in a well, if it's a public well, and soap may be purchased in calle haboneros, uh, which comes from the word sabon, habon, in Binondo. And according to Mala, uh, he said that they were paid 10 pesos monthly. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, look at the, uh, the lavanderas. Uh, uh, so sometimes the clothes are, um, are, uh, there's, if you see the background, there's a clothesline also. And uh, there would be a, a clothes also spread out on, in the grass. No? And their source of water is behind them. So, but you know, washing clothes before was really a laborious task. You have to well, wash it with laundry, with soap, then you make uh, kula, no? kinukula yan. Uh, after the kula, you have to uh, uh, wash it again. Meron pang almirol. <laughs> so it really will occupy your whole day. Uh, but look at them. I like this picture because these are women socializing. It's a social art for them as well because they don't work uh, individually. So it's really... Uh, something to look forward to. Next slide, please. Okay, so you have also the lavandera there. So, uh, 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 drying the clothes, the uh, shirt, or the, uh, yes, the shirt, I in uh, uh, by spreading it uh, on grass. Next slide, please. Okay, the fourth. The tinderas, we have a lot of documentation of the tinderas. Some are in print, some are uh, um, in pictures already. This would be early 20th century with the wall of intramuros in the background of the tree. No? So usually, uh, uh, as you will see in the picture, they have no shoes, they are shot. No? Uh, sapatos. But uh, both are selling their ambulant the peddlers. They walk around and the uh, one on the left would be a fruit uh, vendor. This one on the right, a photo, we have no idea, but they have a bilao or a, a basket uh, a balance on their heads. It's balanced. Imagine they're not holding it. They, they're so skilled uh, to balance the basket. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. On the left uh, is uh, a lichera. A li lichera comes from the word leche. Uh, it's not the cast word, no, it's milk. No milk uh, in Spanish. And she is selling uh, milk. She's a milkmaid, in other words. And um, you have uh, on her head, uh, uh, the, the, the milk container and a measuring thing no? uh, to measure the milk that she will have to sell. But usually the tindera, the lechera, they work early in the morning 
about four, they start uh, uh, giving milk to their customers. Then they return home and uh, uh, again, make the rounds at four in the afternoon. So of course the milk we're, uh, we're referring to here would be carabao milk. That's, it's not the cow's milk, but the carabao milk. Now on the right, this one is also a print and it is identified, you have the lichera and the panadero. So she uh, shows uh, the, in her basket on her head will be the containers of the milk. And of course, on her head would be the measuring um, uh, thing no? uh, for her to be able to uh, measure whatever is needed by the customer. The panadero, of course, will be the one selling uh, bread. No? Okay. Uh, so in print, whether in print or in uh, pictures, they usually have no, uh, they aren't shot, no, walang shoes sila. Okay, here on the left would be your tindera de uh, isda, no, uh, uh, pesca. And the one on the right will be a tindera of uh, clay pots. Uh, so you will see the working women uh, cannot, uh, because of their conditions and their occupation, uh, really have to have working clothes. And this would be the working clothes that they would have. You still have the barro, you still have the saya, and you still have the tapis. You know? But there's more freedom uh, of movement uh, with the kind of dress or apparel that they have. You know? Next slide, please. Okay, the tindera ng badig and the tindera ng bigas. So the bigas was not uh, sold by kilo, by ganta. So the ganta is a wooden sort of box that, uh, uh, that is used to measure whatever uh, rice the customer would like to uh, have. I don't know if you have still seen or experiencing a ganta uh, as a measuring uh, instrument. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, the uh, uh, the left is the buyera. The the buyera is the one who sells buyo or the betel nut chew, no nganga, nganga. So she uh, usually. Uh, her, her, her stall is an elevated uh, platform. And then uh, you see her uh, with all the ingredients of the betel nut chew. You have the bunga, which is the betel nut. You have the lime, which is the white thing there. And you have the ikmo or the leaf. So uh, she, will, uh, she will be the one to prepare for you the, the kind of buyo uh, or betel nut chew you would be interested not to masticate. Now, uh, in literature, you will see that her stall is um, a favorite place of, uh, of males. Uh, and um, so they gravitate towards her. Some would like to court her if she's still unmarried, etc. And uh, if she's still unmarried uh, and uh, uh, medyo type naman niya, o kung hindi niya type, well, halimbawa, yung nagpapagawa ng nganga, she will make it bitter. But if uh, medyo uh, type niya, or I mean, uh, interesting na uh, boyfriend, or let's say, then he will make it, uh, she will make it a very nice kind of betel nut chew. So uh, in a sense, it's some form of nonverbal communication. You're not saying I don't like you, uh, but uh, nonverbal. No? And uh, sometimes she is said to uh, utter the word slintik osyoso. Uh, and um, so uh, because this buyera is very pretty from the print, talaga naman uh, magiging uh, object of uh, suitors. No? Then uh, against a, um, you will see on the right of this, uh, 
uh, called the sugar cane, no? also to masticate. No? In other words, the, the idea here is you masticate something bitter a bit because of the bunga, uh, but at the same time, you can end it with masticating yung tubo. Uh? Now, you have on the right the carindilia. So these are examples of women who are not who are not ambulant, they're not walking. They have a puesto, in other words, a stall. And here is a stall uh, of a carindiria. So you have uh, uh, the food there, parang turo-turo. Uh, you have all the food on the left uh, platform and the right platform will be the dining area. Uh -huh. And you see there the only rice uh, there uh, and the, uh, of course, water is uh, coming from the jars with your coconut dipper there. Huh? Okay. Uh, next slide, please. So, in conclusion, the cigarreras were the first factory workers of Manila, huh? and they were known for their skill in rolling cigars. They were also the first overseas workers, as uh, some of them, as I mentioned were sent to Surabaya, Indonesia, to teach the women there to roll cigars. The second would be the grouping of the Custureras, Sinamayeras, and Bordadoras, who worked together to cloth the denizens of Manila and its Arabales. And the third would be the Lavanderas and Tinderas, providing valuable services to the residents of Manila. You know, uh, when I, uh, when I look back on the cigarreras, um, what struck me uh, about them, I didn't know their big population before. What uh, struck me when I was doing my dissertation was uh, I came across a bundle or a ligaho, uh, which was uh, uh, labeled uh, El, uh, Alboroto, the cigarreras de Manila, no. Uh, so uh, al alboroto. When when one reads the contents, it's actually um, a strike. The the cigarreras were holding a strike by not coming to work, no. But since the recorder was a male, and since there was the feeling in the nineteenth century that uh, women were not capable of striking, the recorder um, passed it off as a mere tantrum. No? Uh, so when they didn't report to work, they were just having a tantrum. When in fact, they were staging a strike. So uh, when I, I found that very refreshing because of course in college, uh, we know that women during the Spanish period were like Maria Clara. Uh, they were timid, they were coy, uh, prone to fainting, etc. So I, uh, I found that very refreshing. So when I returned back after my studies uh, to Manila, I did research on the cigarreras and that's why I knew where to find them in the Philippine National Archives. And that's where I got acquainted with them more. But when I was doing this presentation and I was using a primary source called Vecindarios, it dawned on me another aspect that they were really a big population in Manila in the 19th century. And yet documentation on them is very scanty. I mean, no one I found, no one really talked about the cigarreras. Uh, and uh, that, that really um, challenged me really to, uh, to know more about them. But it was while doing this presentation that the uh, primary sources supported the big number of cigarreras in Manila. Okay. On that note, thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Kumagai. That was truly a very enlightening presentation. And I'm sure a lot of us 
have learned something new today and not to mention something very timely and relevant considering that uh, we are celebrating Women's Month today. Now for our viewers, I'm sure you have a lot of questions. I'm, I'm, I'm already getting a lot of your questions now. Now, if you would like to engage, if you'd like to raise any questions, the Q&A button is available in the, uh, in the, at the bottom of your screen. For those who are viewing via Facebook Live, you can also key in your questions in the comment section. So I'm also monitoring the Facebook Live for any questions. Now, please take note that, uh, of course, your names will appear if you if you ask a question and of course i will bring up your name and if you wish if you wish to remain anonymous you can simply uh, use the q a button and then click there's a button there for anonymous option or you can like follow up and say that uh, can this question be an anonymous of course i will respect that now ma'am so this is a very interesting ano presentation talaga ang dami talaga nating natutunan uh, i understand ma'am that this was your dissertation back in your doctorate at, uh, at france uh, actually uh, no uh, i was my dissertation was uh, urban development of manila in the 19th century mm -hmm. uh, via the French consular dispatches. Mm. Uh, yeah, but I was given the opportunity by my professor, you go to Fra uh, to Spain, uh, you take a look at their documents as well for your topic. So uh, he made me choose. You go home to the Philippines for a vacation or you go to Spain. Of course, you will want to go to Spain. And don't go to France. So I said I prefer to to uh, no, to go to Spain and then do uh, continue my research there. So uh, it was in the course of um, doing my dissertation on urban development of Manila in the 19th century. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, where you ano, ma'am? In the course of your ano. Uh, in your uh, professional experience, were you able, ma'am, to come up with a follow-up study? Because um, it would be really interesting then to see a trend of the mm -hmm. occupations towards the early 19th century, towards the American era, or mm -hmm. was this, ma'am, just focused on the Spanish era, uh, later half of the 19th century? Uh, there is one, um, uh, one PhD student, and she's a graduate already, she earned her dissertation, Judy Tagiwalo. Mm. Uh, Judy Tagiwalo was my advisee. She was taking a look at working women during the American period. Uh, so meron naman, nagpapatuloy. No? Uh, so she took a look at, uh, and uh, there you see again, uh, continuation ng Sigarera. No? Uh, they were now more organized. Actually, I think one, one uh, advantage of the Sigarreras where they were organized so they can be mobilized, they can hold a strike, etc. Uh, the other occupations, they are not organized there. No? So, but the Sigarreras, they were organized. So uh, uh, they continued up to the uh, early American period but because America introduced uh, cigarettes, namatay yun ano, medyo nag-decline yun pag ng cigars, kasi uh, mas naging popular ang cigarettes. So women also took to smoking cigarettes. So naging parang very uh, uh, specialized and thing now to smoke cigars. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, regarding that, ma'am, Violeta has this question. Having many cigars, was there a study or were you able to come up with any information that these women smoked as well? Ah, the cigars? The cigarreras po. Oh, I think so. They did. They did. Uh, you are there na, no? But do not smuggle. Uh, because, you know, as far as I was able to dig into the primary sources, wala akong nakitang ano, cases of smuggling out. Talagang very honest. 
So they may smoke, but they will not get it from the factory. Ha? They will not get it. Meron kasing at that time, para mga estangkos na tinatawag lang, mga stalls where you can buy cigars. No? Mm. So you, uh, because it's a state monopoly. So the stalls are also state owned. Mm. Mm. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, follow up then po from our Zoom participant here. So uh, anonymous attendee. Uh, were there health hazards in the cigar factory? So since nagsusmoke po sila among others, do you, were there er, ever any like mga sakit that ever came up later in life? Were you able to follow uh, up on that po? Uh, not, not really. But uh, the government, the, the uh, let's say the um, uh, administration, were also concerned with uh, the health. No, That's why... Uh, there would be uh, some, uh, what they call this, construction of, uh, in other words, they, they expanded. No? Kasi ang hirap na naman, you're in a congested place and you have the smell there and the sound. So uh, I think they were concerned because they will have to uh, make the factory bigger no? so as to make, have more spacing uh, among the tables. So uh, they did that. What I discovered was that they were entitled to maternity leave. Hmm. So uh, they were entitled to maternity leave of, uh, of uh, 30 days or a month. But the administration would usually uh, only allow 20 days of maternity leave. Huh? Thank you, ma'am, for that. So it's interesting that they have maternity leave. Oh, yes. They so, enlightened sila sa bagay na yan. Okay. So were there any you know, po, like organized uh, unions perhaps or was this uh, later na? Later. During the early American period, there were many, there were strikes. No? Uh, uh, not only among the cigarettes, but even the male. Uh, uh, people, the males who were working in the cigar um, manufacturing sector. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, we have a question here from Leoncio from uh, Zoom. Uh, were maestas and domestic help not included in the list of the officials of the period? Uh, there would be, but not very many. They are identified with the word criada. Criada or uh, servidumbres domesticas, they're identified. But uh, they were, I think, uh, patronized by the rich. It was not a common, uh, I mean, households during the Spanish period did not, could not afford no, that, that uh, service of a uh, domestic servant. So they will appear in the vicendario no, as criada, in one, for example, in suburbio, mga one or two, but not very, it was not a widespread kind of occupation. So are we saying, ma'am, that there's also a scarcity of upper class in Manila as well? Yeah. No, usually they are found in the houses inside Intramuros, the residences of the Spaniards. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who could afford them. No, and they were really very much, um, uh, let's say, surveillance was very, very close with regards to these criadas because uh, I discovered again uh, in the archives, they come under the bundle uh, criadas or servidumbres domesticas or uh, domestic servants um, that they have to be uh, have a libreta. In other words, they had to enroll themselves in the police something. No? And uh, they are advised uh, that the Amos should only accept uh, domestic servants with a libreta, no? uh, where you have a description there, no? okay, her name, her physical uh, features, et cetera, her, her, uh, she's a native of what place, etc., etc. Now, when you ask, 
why naman that kind of detail? Because there will be cases when this uh, servidubres domesticas will live without permission. Mm. Huh? So they will make a French leave. When I was reading the documents, I sabi ko parang ngayon pa rin nangyayari yan. Yan aalis yung kasambahay na walang paalam. Ha? So, uh, buti nga dito ngayon, hindi natin out missing. Itong kasambahay, ang height niya ay 4'11, mata, kulay na mata. We don't do that, but during the Spanish period, you see that in the newspapers, they will, uh, they will show a miss, of course, no picture, but the name, the physical uh, characteristics will be there. Huh? Hmm. Then, makikita mo rin yun na hindi, uh, hindi lang nagpaalam, meron pang ninakaw, nung lumayas ng bahay, meron pa rin yung kaso ng utang ng utang, ang dami na daw kamag-anak ang namatay, ang na binabanggit. So I said, it's not, it's not new because it still exists up to now, di ba? Yung mga ganun incident. So I really found that, oh my, there are things which change and there are things that continue mm, in history, you. di ba? Uh, we have uh, questions as well from Facebook. So we have here uh, a question from Bernard. Uh, what uh, regarding putting the cigars? Uh, what happened to the trim portion of the cigars? Po? They were they recycled or sold as uh, secondhand quality tobacco for the local smokers? Uh, I uh, I have no information. What happens to the um, unused? I guess the re recycled then. There would be, uh, and uh, then made to, uh, siguro, lalong lalo na, nung ang uh, tobacco monopoly ended. Kasi, you know, the reason why uh, uh, the, there's really a close supervision of the state was because they wanted to remain that the price becomes high. So, dapat kontrolado mo yung supply. So, it remains high. But when the monopoly ended, then probably talagang uh, there would be use of uh, other parts of the cigar that can be used still, no? Uh, as uh, siguro, hindi na quality talaga, but for everyday use no, of cigars. Thank you, ma'am. We have a question from Ferdinand. Uh, with the occupation available for women there, then, was there a more high-paying job for them aside from what was enumerated? And if I may, ma'am, what was the highest paying job? Ah, okay. You would have uh, women in the professions no? during the 19th century. And there would be women who would enter uh, the teaching profession, yung mga mestras. And there would be women who become licensed midwives, o yung tinatawag matronas titulares. So yun yun medyo uh, mataas ang kanilang sahod, no? And yung sahod nila, for example, for the mestra, uh, they, uh, uh, it depends on how you finish your, uh, uh, your schooling as a mestra. Kung mataas yung grade mo, you are assigned to a uh, first class province. No? Uh, and so on, uh, ganun rin. Parang ang nagiging ano ng... ng uh, Spanish government non, you give the best to the first class no, uh, province. And that happened also with the matrona titulado no, or your licensed midwives. Kung mataas ang grade mo, uh, nakatapos ko ng mahusay, then you go to the uh, first class uh, provinces. No? Now, when, when you speak, therefore, of wages, ang very, very clear lang for the mestras, mas mataas pa rin ang sahod ng lalaki kaysa babaeng mestra. Ang katwiran nila dito, the reasoning, is that the males are usually the breadwinners. So they should get higher pay than the women. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, regarding po that uh, uh, male, uh, female na kind of jobs, we have a question po from Lira. 
Uh, may, may it be assumed that women work regardless whether they were single or married? Were there situations where both the parents, both the husband and the wife, contributed to the earnings of the household? Yeah. Yung earning of the households, pwede. Uh, the husband and wife can do a, some occupation. No? Then uh, when you take a look at the vicendario, I was really amazed that... Uh, Um, walang identification ng housewife. Mm. There's none. Palaging, ayan, kusturera, labadera, sigarera. Pero yung uh, housewife, wala. So we can say that uh, uh, at that time, it was already um, you know, a, a normal thing that the husband and wife will have uh, two occupations. So they're both earning. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, have you encountered any information how these uh, jobs uh, affected their family life, especially since women diba, are expected to be a mother and to work full time in the house? So how did this affect their family, the quality of the family life? You know, uh, I think uh, you will have to take a look at the... Uh, uh, class structure, no? Kasi for me, uh, the working class women really were, you know, they were liberal, they were active. Uh, kasi yung atin na uso ng uh, women during the Spanish period nga, eh, yung, yung maya, mayaman, yung ganyan. So it's, uh, uh, I feel that uh, the upper class women at that time we're following a certain template of how women should uh, behave, like yung mga sab- kasabihan ni Urbana at Felisa, no? something like that. Uh, but the working class women really were different. I mean, the ordinary women were different. They were more, they were more active. They were more free. I, it always comes to my mind. Look at Salome in the novel of No Lead in Tangere of Isal. She was, uh, she was living in with uh, Elias. Uh, yun yung ano, tinatawag natin live in relationship. At sa matatanda nun, ito yung tinatawag kasal sa banig. Hindi kasal sa simbahan. Kasal sa banig kasi nagsama lang. And Rizal was aware of that. You know? And they showed it uh, in that situation where you have Elias and Salome living together. No? So uh, parang hindi parang freer I feel the ordinary women were freer compared to the upper class women. Thank you ma'am. Uh, we have a question from John Mario. So this is a very interesting question. Are there any documentations about prostitution or other illegal occupations in Manila? If there is then Who documented it or what institutions documented it? Nako. I, it's included in my book, Working Women of Manila. And, you know, uh, so I uh, dealt with cigarreras, uh, mestras, uh, matronas, tiladas. The last chapter is prostitutas no? or mujer publicas or public women. And when my I, I tell my class, oh, sige, you choose one occupation and uh, we'll discuss in class. You know, the ones they like, very favorite, the prostitutes. They love, they love to find out. So they like voyeurs, no, in a sense, because kusung sumilip, ano ba yung buhay ng isang uh, uh, prostitute o mujer publica? And you will be able to document because uh, there in the Philippine National Archives would be again bundles on prostitutas or mujer publicas or public women. So in that in the book, uh, chapter in the book, Working Women of Manila, I, I was able to uh, discuss it because, you know, when I was in France, uh, so, social history was very much um, uh, alive and very active. And uh, so they take a look at prostitutes. And I said, let me take a look at the Philippine side of prostitutes. 
So meron, if you read the chapter, the, because why, 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 why do you have a lot of documents on them? Uh, in the first place, there was in the 19th century, uh, the epidemic uh, proportion of syphilis, syphilis no? and uh, they were concerned about uh, how to control, to regulate no? uh, prostitution because it's supposed to be the way of how people uh, contract syphilis. So talagang uh, very, I noticed, according to the documents, they will, it was really a criminal act. Talagang pag nahuli ka, no? Uh, depende rin. Yung first uh, part of uh, the, uh, let's say, criminalization of prostitution, they were really uh, incarcerated. Uh, if they're sick, they're brought to the San Juan de Jos hospital because siguro they have been infected. And the worst punishment is you are deported. Alam nyo naman naman Castilla, mahilig sa deportation. And so these prostitutes were deported to Balabac in Palawan or in Davao. No? And these were at that time very far, very remote, unpeopled, depopulated. And for the Spaniards, it was not only addressing punishment as a form, but also addressing populating that place. Kasi walang tao. No? So you will have all these prostitutes or uh, there, uh, or some men who are also uh, not naman prostitutes. They were there for political reasons. And some, they really ask permission, can they get married? No? So they meet and they decide to get married, still staying in Balabac, for example, or in Davao. So may mga ganong kwento rin. Thank you, ma'am. Naku, baka spoiler na ito sa inyong book. So ma'am, marami pong nagtatanong kasi about your book. Ah! And, uh, I think I found, ito po ba yun, ma'am? Yan! Yes. Available po yes. ito, ma'am? Saan po pwede mo? Ay, naku! Wala na out of print. <laughs> yeah, but I have been asking UP Press if they can reprint it. Kasi so far, that's the only talagang uh, archival, uh, parang uh, uh, it uses extensively uh, archival materials. Yeah. Mm. O meron po sa UP Diliman Library at National <laughs> Library. <laughs> okay, so marami po po mga tanong. So, isisiksik natin sa oras as much as we can. Uh, okay, ma'am. Uh, these occupations po, kasi I, I, parang, if you're going to look at it, are tied with the idea of gender roles. Mm -hmm. so, the idea that some jobs are more suitable for a particular sex. Now, in your study po, were you able to come across any narrative discussing why these particular jobs were more suitable or preferable for women. So parang during that time, what are the qualities or characteristics of women perceived, of course, that made them ideal to be a costurera or to be a cigarera, etc.? Why not the men? Ah, why not the men? Because if we take a look at the occupations like... Uh, lavandera, uh, tindera, or costurera. They really are, um, let's say, usual home chores. No? Gawain ng babae. Uh, karaniwang gawain ng babae. No? So they usual. That's why very radical yun lumabas ang babae sa bahay at pumasok ng pabrika. No? Uh, that one is very revolutionary because uh, it's very radical. She no longer, uh, in a sense, uh, does her usual home chores. She goes out of the house and works in a factory setup and she gets paid. Uh, she gets paid. Of course, I'm not saying na libre naman yung labadera. So they're paid. But it's not the sense of getting a regular wage because she is a factory worker. No? Mm. So yun yun, ano, yun ang naging kaibahan ng sigarera dun sa mga iba. No? 
So lumabas, nakalabas sa bahay at naging she had to know a skill. Uh, skill yun eh, no? So she had to learn a skill uh, and a new one which really made it very uh, parang uh, let's say uh, by, uh, parang changer yun eh, no? Uh, it really became a game changer for her. Uh, was there a hierarchy mag? I mean Uh, are there, are, parang lahat ba sila, are they the same? Lahat magkakapantay na kusturera, lahat magkakapantay na sigarera? Or was there a hierarchy? Meron. Pa- may, sa sigarera, meron. No? Okay. Kasi uh, iba yung mestra, yung parang supervisory. Iba siya. No? Meron, <laughs> meron supervisory. <laughs> Pero alam nyo, meron ka rin makikita nga, she can be also be the uh, object of a strike. Kasi itong kusturera, ang report, kung ano-anong binibenta sa kanila. Meron tela, nubina, scapularyo. E siyempre, as supervisor, parang kawak niya sa liig itong mga sigarera. So, uh, she can be the object of a complaint because of the... But there's a hierarchy. ha huh? There's a hierarchy among the sigareras. Now, dun sa uh, other, like kusturera o lavandera, meron ako nakikita dun sa bisindaryo na uh, before their name Donya no so sabi ko aba ito ay medyo nakakaanga dahil uh, uh, Donya so s- doon sa kusturera halimbawa ang haka-haka ko lang no i'm just uh, uh, imagining uh, she must be a uh, well of woman who has a talagang dress shop no may dress shop siya So, pumapasok yung mga uh, kusturera sa kanya. Ha? Ngayon, ganun rin doon sa mga bordadora. Pag nakita ko may donya, siguro ito ay may ari ng isang embroidery factory. No? Uh, at sa, may mga empleyado siya dyan. No? Pero yun parang, meron ako one or two sa lavandera. Kasi wow, donya. Meron na naman donya. So I surmise she must be an owner of a laundry shop. No? Uh, that's why she will uh, uh, have that title of Donya uh, before her name. Uh, Ma'am, was the Tindera different from the shop girl? I mean, would you say that the Tindera was uh-huh. more of an ambulant vendor than a shopkeeper? Ah, but you know, they're all lumped together as Tinderas. Tapos may categorization na lang ng ambulant kung stall owner. Mm. Oo. Uh, we have a question po from Mark Ritchie. Ma'am, would you consider these historical evidences of working women, testaments of women empowerment or women labor abuse? Which of those work would you consider a turning point for women during those era? Thank you. Ah, dami niyang tanong. Ano? Uh, <laughs> Ah, uh, talagang uh, ako ha, yun yung nag-strike yung mga sigarera, uh, women empowerment yan. Talagang hindi, they will not take uh, pre- the prevailing conditions sitting down. They wanted change, no? Uh, in terms of working conditions, etc. So, uh, ac- actually, you know, when you take a look at the history of women in the Philippines, um doon na lang sa ating creation story ay very, very egalitarian ang, ang atin male and female. Kasi yun atin creation story, sinasabi si Sikalak at si Sikabay ay lumabas sa buho ng isang kawayan. No? Sabay. Unlike the creation story in the West where Eve was taken from the uh, Tadjangba uh, of, uh, of uh, Adam. No? which already suggests subordination of the female to the male. Huh? But in our creation story, equal, very, kaya nga ang atin even words like asawa, you have to describe asawa babae, asawa lalaki, anak, anak na babae. It's really very gender-free. I mean, uh, when you take a look at it. And uh, however, this autonomy and egalitarian status will change with the colonial period. The colonial period which introduced Judeo-Christian religion 
really has brought about patriarchy, subordination of women to men. No? So, uh, uh, ganun ang nangyari. Uh, but uh, slowly, 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 women are uh, recovering, recuperating uh, their autonomy. Thank you, ma'am. May question po tayo from Annie. May age requirement po ba noon to be a cigarera, buradera, etc.? Was there a regulation po on age? I, I see none. Kasi if we look at the vicindarios, their ages really varied. No? Their ages varied. Uh, may, oh, I tell my RAs, uh, research assistants, tingnan nyo nga ano yung oldest at saka yung youngest. So may oldest, mga 70, ganon. Youngest, 16, 14, ganon. So uh, uh, especially for the occupations, no age requirement. No? Uh, wala pa si digo, siguro notion of child labor. Mm -hmm. The Americans introduced the idea of child labor. I mean, that should not continue. No? Thank you, ma'am. Nako, uh, we have a lot of questions Actually, we have more than 50 questions, so everybody is oh interested in the topic. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, give, uh, just uh, uh, Marcia, give my email and then oh, I will okay. try to reply to their questions through email. Yes. Thank you, po. So as we give out the certificates, of course, we can also share the, uh, the email. Anyway, po, so we shall tire you no further, ma'am. So we are already one hour and 30 minutes. So... Uh, we shall wrap up na po. Now, to end this open forum, one last question po. Isang pang motherhood na question. Uh, to end this webinar with your wisdom on the working women, uh, on your wisdom of on, on our ancestors who were working women, what is your message for the modern working women today now that we are celebrating Women's Month? Uh, let us, ano, let us, uh, for my tabaro, let us, you know, be conscious of um, uh, elevating, no, I mean, making women there in the forefront because, uh, in fact, now, not only women, there's now even gender and that becomes wider, no? And dami dami na. Kaya nga baka eventually, women's studies will become gender studies and you have to reckon with all the, the genders uh, in mind. But uh, as for women, uh, fellow Filipino women, let us uh, cap it busy. No? Uh, let us uh, uh, support, be supportive of one another. Let us support a woman president uh, who I think, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> makatayo ma election, but let us show that women uh, is the last man standing, as, as they said. Okay, thank, thank you, you Rancho. So okay, po, so announcements lang po sa ating mga viewers. So, wait lang po. So, uh, for future webinars. So this is our 73rd episode, diba? So we definitely will have future episodes. So tuloy na tuloy pa rin ito. So for updates on succeeding episodes of the Intramurals Learning Sessions, feel free to follow us in Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, and YouTube. And for those who came in late or for those who missed this episode, you can, of course, uh, go to our YouTube channel so that you can replay this uh, session. Now, uh, I also like to advertise our next webinar. So this is episode number 74 of the Intomorrow's Learning Session. So this is on April 5. So we're going to have Father Emilio Quilatan, who will discuss the history, heritage, and legacy of the Colegio de Santa Rosa, one of the original schools in Intomorrow's and one of the pioneer educational institutions in the country. Right. So thank you so much, Mom, for... Uh, My pleasure. Time. My pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for joining us in our webinar. So we hope to see you again. And, Mom, we hope now we can invite you again in the future. Sure. No sure. See you, Mom. So, feel free po. Okay. Um, I end ko na po ito. So, okay. Okay.
Bye bye. Bye ma'am. Bye. Uh, for those who are asking about the certificate, uh, we're going to issue certificates, of course. Now we're going to give uh, out feedback forms via email. So it's a prerequisite for the certificate. Just need to revert back the feedback form, and then we're going to give you a certificate afterwards. Thank you. Thank you again for joining us. And till next time, folks.